Hi, I'm Dubba. I'm the director of Music Tech Fest, and this is the MTF Podcast. Charles S. is a professor of media studies at the University of Oslo. He's a philosopher specialising in ethics, and specifically the study of ethics as it relates to things like AI, computers, and the internet. He literally wrote the book on digital media ethics in his book, Digital Media Ethics, and he's also the former president of the Association of Internet Researchers. Charles is spending a month in my adopted hometown of Umeå in the north of Sweden as a guest of Humlab, the humanities laboratory at Umeå University, where there's a lot of work being done right now in the field of AI ethics. He's given guest lectures and workshops while he's been here, which have been fascinating and helpfully incredibly accessible. And I wanted to sit down with him and talk about this idea of human-centered AI, which has kind of been at the heart of MTF in everything we've done over this past year or so. We talked about a lot of things from digital death to autonomous vehicles, Greta Thunberg to Will Smith, the book of Genesis to the wisdom of Leonard Cohen, the importance of empathy, and how to lead a good and reflective life. Here's Charles S. Charles S., thank you so much for being on the program. Entirely my pleasure. Thank the you. The S is me. not for anything, that's the whole name. That's the whole name. It caused a lot of trouble when I was young. Okay. Uh, both when I wanted to make long distance calls. Uh, how do you spell that name again? S, spelled E S S. Sess? No. And of course, junior high jokes about my first name is Jack. Oh, Jack S. Ha ha ha. So, yes. And where's the name from originally? It's German. Okay. Yeah. It's German, and it may have actually Dutch Dutch heritage behind it, but uh, yeah. That's not a German accent. That's not a German accent, no. That's fully American. Yeah. So where, where are you from? Uh, born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma, mm-hmm. uh, land of Leon Russell and Michael Doonesbury, which you probably don't know. Yeah, very well. Uh, oh, you do know? Cartoonist. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. And then Oral Roberts, so we say two out of three is not bad. <laughs> <laughs> But there is a religious thread in what you do, so maybe yeah. he'll b- pop up uh, a little bit later in the conversation. May as well get it over now. Um, yeah, that I, when I was growing up, we, we thought that Tulsa was the buckle of the Bible Belt. Found out later, no, that was Springfield, Missouri, where I ended up teaching for about 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I, I didn't spend all my time in that kind of community, but some which turned out to be good uh, in a number of ways. I, so I describe myself as a recovering Baptist. Um, I did learn to take text seriously, so it was very good for hermeneutics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was also reading Nietzsche at the same time I was reading the Bible. Uh, and um, to interpret a text is, is difficult work. It's not obvious. So contrary to the fundamentalism that was around, uh, I was able to start to, to read things in my own way. Mm-hmm. And so when, uh, when the Baptist preacher said from the pulpit, all of us young men should go off to Vietnam and kill in the name of Jesus, I, I'm not seeing that in that text. Mm. So um, I became a conscientious objector. Uh, so that's, that's part of the story. Mm. The other part of the story, or another part of the story, is that gave me an advantage in terms of teaching. Two-thirds of my students in Springfield were self-identified born again Christians, and I was teaching philosophy and ethics and all like that, critical thinking. But I had an edge over some of my colleagues because I knew the language and I knew how to use it in a way that was respectful, but could also help open up the discussion. So that was unexpected advantage. It was many years later that uh, actually when I started studying, going into media studies out of philosophy, uh, that I ran into, uh, well, partly reading this through the eyes of people like Walter Ong and uh, Marshall McLuhan, uh, that the, the motto of the Protestant Reformation is sola scriptura, only the scripture. Uh, so again, you're, you're coming to grips with this text is, is literally life and death. But it also means the capacity to stand up, resist, and disobey. Uh, which is something that I think is really central to the Western tradition, starting with Antigone and Socrates. Mm. I point to people like Tess Asplund, who is is quite famous in this part of the world, uh, a black woman in Sweden who stood up single-handedly to neo-Nazis marching in Gothenburg. I think we need people like that. Uh, I think they change our world in more just ways, in ways of greater equality, greater respect, greater emancipation. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it doesn't come cheap or easy. (laughs) 
The main reason that we're here having this conversation mm. is because you happen to be in the same city as me. Right. You are uh, the professor of essentially uh, AI and ethics and how those things come together. Um, I'm going to start with, because we've discussed AI quite a lot right. on this podcast. What's ethics? Ethics is how you live your life in a reflective way. Some people make a distinction. It depends between morality and ethics. And morality is sort of the, the, the acculturated ways of doing things and not necessarily anything wrong with that. But ethics is when you start, in my view, is when you start to become reflective and try to think through critically what are the foundational values, where do they come from, why are they legitimate, are they legitimate, when and where, under what contexts. Uh, and, and a central part of that is developing uh, the kind of ethical judgment you heard me talk about, phronesis. Um, a kind of reflective judgment that we we all kind of know about but find hard to articulate. But it's when we're in those places facing ethical challenges that we really don't know what the right answer is. That's when we have to call uh, call into play these kinds of capacities for reflective judgment that um, you don't have to have a PhD in philosophy um, or in ethics. I don't have a PhD in ethics. <laughs> But the more that we can reflect on this using story from tradition or using uh, ethical frameworks that have been developed over the, over time in different cultures, uh, generally the better prepared we are for when when those moments come. Uh, and we also learn from our mistakes when those moments come. Uh, so we might be better prepared the next time around. How can we tell when we're doing it right? You can't always, of course. Otherwise, it'd be fairly easy. Um, I think um, one of the things that I like to stress uh, is that uh, all of us are ethicists uh, to start with. This is a very Aristotelian view, but it's also a kind of sociological view. Um, by the time you're in your teens or 20s or that part of life, you know how to make good judgments or else you'd be in jail or dead. Um <laughs> Some people are. Some people are. Um, I'm sorry, really. But uh, again, we rely on, on a, a kind of received morality. We rely on the, the advice or examples of friends or exemplars and that kind of thing. Mm. But um, we don't always know. And that one of the, the primary metaphors or images of this kind of reflective judgment is in Plato. And it's the Kubernetes. It's the steersman or the pilot. And if you've ever done something like sailing, uh, what you know is, yeah, you've, you've studied in a way, you, you know how these things work, but you also have a feel uh, for how your boat is moving in this current, with this wind, at this angle, and so forth. And that becomes tacit knowledge, that becomes embodied knowledge. So the Kubernetes uh, is the steerman who, Plato says, who, who knows the limits of his art, what you can do, what you can't do, and if you do make a mistake, you're able to correct the error. And that sense of self-correction is what Norbert Wiener used as the foundation for cybernetics. And Wiener also wrote the first um, ethics textbook in computing and information ethics. But cybernetics is originally an ethical sense of self-correction. So I, I think that most of us, um, when we make mistakes, we often feel those mistakes. So we, we talk about heartache or we talk about it was like a kick in the stomach. And contrary wise, we often will say, um, I followed my gut feeling, I followed my heart. That's not naive. This kind of ethical experience is encoded in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And we bring that into play, some usually in an unconscious way, mm -hmm. just like we do when we're sailing or when we're playing tennis. We don't always have to reflect. Uh, to do the right thing. So I think if we pay attention to our ethical experience, we'll notice for the most part, yeah, I'm doing the right thing all the time. So I don't have to think about it, right? I didn't kill anybody. Um, I didn't run down this person on the road. I, all those However, things, I, you I mean, you, you mentioned <laughs> narratives from history as right. being sort of guiding principles. A lot of the people who we look to in history and those stories who do act like icons of, right. of ethics do end up dead or in jail yeah. uh, as a result of their actions. Yeah. And, and what lessons can we learn from that? Being good is costly. Um, part of the reason why those people are held up is precisely that they paid the ultimate price, would be one way of putting it. 
So Jesus on the cross, or Socrates, or Antigone, uh, Martin Luther King being assassinated, Gandhi being assassinated. It doesn't always end that way. One of my moral heroes is a, a fellow named uh, Hugh Thompson. Uh, he was a helicopter pilot at the My Lai Massacre. And uh, when he saw what was going on, uh, this is basic law of war. You as a soldier are obliged to obey superior orders. You are obliged to disobey superior but illegal orders. And to kill civilians is an illegal order, period, full stop. And so when Thompson and uh, his unit arrived, they saw what was going on. They turned their own guns against their comrades mm. to get them to stop. He received a medal for it 50 years later, but he's, he, did, he wasn't killed. <laughs> uh, so so we, it's partly that these, these stick in the memory mm -hmm. because they're dramatic, but we also talk about everyday heroes. And uh, those stories may be less dramatic, but uh, happily they also end up with fewer casualties. Okay, so now we need to apply this to technology oh. and uh, uh, how you get from not running people over on the street, mm. for instance, mm. to designing an autonomous vehicle. Mm. And, and what are the thought processes in that? If those things are embodied and innate yeah. uh, and automatic, if you like, how, right. do you, how do you write that into an automatic right. system? And that's, that's exactly the great trick. And, and, and many of us think you can't that you can get close and you can approximate, but you can't ultimately do it in quite the same way that a human being would do because the, the systems don't have that sense of embodied presence in the world. They don't have a sense of desire. They don't have a sense of emotion. They can't feel one way or another. Um, and so th I think the best we'll be able to do is, is some kind of approximations. Mm -hmm. What I find heartening is that Three or four years ago, when autonomous vehicles were all the sort of buzz, uh, everybody was talking about the trolley problem, and we were going to solve this with, you know, kind of simple-minded utilitarianism, cost-benefit approach, you know, five lives versus one. And we're not hearing so much about that anymore. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason we're not hearing so much about that anymore is it doesn't work. And most of us realize it won't work after a few minutes of careful reflection. We have to bring in other kinds of uh, value judgments that are very hard to quantify, much less automate in a system. There, there are people who would say, well, we can approximate this through AI and machine learning techniques. And perhaps that's true. But there are approximations. And there are approximations that can literally very likely go off the rails in a very bad way very quickly. Uh, so I think uh, I think we're learning to be very cautious. Uh, as I mentioned, the the IEEE is now arguing for putting ethically aligned design in these systems from the very beginning. So at the design phase, and their ethical recommendations are they include utilitarianism, but it's much richer and much broader. So we have to start with making sure that human integrity, autonomy, respect basic rights, that these always remain protected. Um, and we have to use virtue ethics. Uh, we have to design uh, these technologies so that they're not simply for the sake of somebody's profit or somebody's convenience. They are for the sake of human flourishing and the good of society. This is a remarkable transformation. I've been paying attention to this for a really long time. And if you had said that we would be at this place 10 years ago, I no, sorry. <laughs> but it's like the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. um, it's just an extraordinary sort of uh, coalescence now between the technical communities and the, the philosophers and other other stakeholders. But they're not the ones paying the bill, though. The the technical community and the philosophers all have uh, involvement in, mm -hmm. and, and a stake in it. Yeah. Uh, but they're not Google. They they might work for Google right. um, or Apple or whoever right. it might be. So to what extent does this agreement actually impact upon what happens right. yeah. uh, by the people who are commissioning these uh, technologies? Right. Excellent question. Um, and it can, it can go in a couple of ways. One is... This is also driving uh, the EU and the EU regulation on AI. So you get notions of AI for people or AI for good. Uh, Virginia Dignam here, for example, has a new book out on responsible AI that reflects this. So within the EU and Scandinavia, again, this is remarkable, but uh, incredibly heartening that um, 
we have this sort of very strong and central recognition that we have to do, if we're going to develop these systems, first of all, they have to be within frameworks of regulation. And that regulation in turn is driven by a very, very clear set of ethical standards. So that I think is, is extraordinary. We, we can be very, <laughs> very happy about this, very grateful. Uh, the flip side, um, Google is not in the EU or Microsoft or Apple uh, and so forth. True. And I don't want to underestimate by any means the sort of autonomous power that those corporations have. At the same time, there's a little bit of glimmer of hope. They exist to make a profit, and they get that profit by selling to customers. And when customers and or their workers say, I'm sorry, this isn't good enough, grudgingly they will respond, or maybe sometimes not so grudgingly. So I think if there is a virtue in the free market, it's that the companies do respond if they have, you know, they can be forced, they can be brought to the table, so to speak, either by customers uh, who, who just say, I'm sorry, I'm not buying it, literally, and or who may protest against one wrinkle or another, um, and or workers inside. I mean, some of this, we don't have a lot of stories of this, but the fellow who invented the Facebook like button ended up deciding this was a terrible idea. The whole thing of social media nudging reinforcement of behaviors was a terrible idea, and he stepped out. Mm-hmm. And so there has now been this kind of, he's, he and others have founded a kind of counter movement uh, in the technology world. And there are counter movements that if people want to, they can participate in yeah. as, as alternatives. I guess the counter argument from the free market mm-hmm. perspective would be that if you write the legislation mm-hmm. first, you block the innovation. Right. You, you can't innovate in an environment where you're just simply not allowed to try things. Yeah, that's an argument, but I'm not sure. I don't find it persuasive, uh, and partly because, um, as I have seen the the history of technology and the history of innovation, broadly the spirit or the story is that the people who are innovating, who are creating products, et cetera, who are taking risks, let's give them credit, yes, they always scream, we can't do it if there's regulation. So there's a classic example Andrew Feinberg writes about when the steam engine was introduced. And steam engines kept blowing up because they were shoddily made and people died. And a few thoughtful, reflective people said, maybe we should regulate these. And, oh, you can't do that. That's going to make it impossible. All the arguments came out. After about 50,000 people had died because of shoddy steam engines, finally there was enough public pressure to get the the regulations or the laws that were needed for safety. Mm. And you see that over and over again. So I'm not persuaded that these claims that somehow innovation is going to be stifled ahead of time. I I would much rather have, I mean, a counter-response to the counter-response is, so why do we need so much innovation exactly? especially if that innovation is, so to speak, outside of the bounds of law. What is it offering us that we really, really need that we can't do through legal or ways of of organizing our technologies that respect human values, not just corporate profit? Mm -hmm. Not to put too fine of a point on that. (laughs) I'm reluctant to keep going back to the example of the autonomous vehicles thing, but but ethics is a really clear, it's a really clear use case for for ethics. Um, And one of the things that strikes me about autonomous vehicles is that there seems to be a a prerequisite that they be safe, Mm. not safer than human drivers, but safe. Mm. And I'm wondering, is there in, in your mind this kind of idea where, if we reduced, let's say, by half the number of motor vehicle accidents, then autonomous vehicles should be implemented, you know, right across the board? Or do we wait until you can't have accidents anymore? Hmm. That's also a really good question. And I think it probably depends on the country you find yourself in. The, the arguments I've heard for autonomous vehicles have been very strongly in the direction of utilitarian ones, that if we dramatically reduce accident rates, then what's the problem? Uh, and uh, prima facie, yeah, it sounds great. The problem, there are several problems that line up. One of them is um, it, it turns out <laughs> that autonomous vehicles uh, can and probably ought to be programmed in such a way that if the choice is between saving the driver or five people, it'll save the five people. Now, are you as a driver going to go buy a car that you know might literally kill you if it thinks that's the best decision? 
not many of us are going to step into that kind of context, mm. I don't think. So there's, there's, and there's also a question of rights uh, that are raised by that. So um, I suspect that in the U.S., you're, I'm rather confident that in the U.S., if you could produce those kinds of vehicles, then you might have a stronger chance at making that kind of utilitarian argument. The flip side is that they found in some studies that people really don't want to give up driving, especially in the U.S. For many people, it's their flow experience. Uh, it's one of the places they have control over their lives. And so there's other things going on in there besides just running a vehicle down the road. Mm. And I, I also wonder, uh, there's a really, I think a really fine movie called I, Robot with Will Smith. And there's a scene in there that literally gets to the heart of this where the Will Smith character is in a car accident. The other vehicle has a driver and a 13-year-old girl. Mm -hmm. A robot sees this, and the robots are programmed to save human lives. And so the robot calculates that Will Smith has a 45% chance of survival, and the 13-year-old girl has an 11% chance of survival. Simple. And what Will Smith says after this is all over is, she was somebody's baby. 11% mm. was enough. Anybody with a heart would have known that, approximately. Yeah. Um, they're just difference engines. They're just lights and clocks. And that's a little bit harsh, but what I find uh, obviously moving in that is this sense that we know something in our ethical judgment that has to do with relationship that we'll take chances that machines wouldn't. Mm. And you could maybe reprogram the machine and say, let's save little girls rather than old men. Okay, fine. And I'm not, still not... I'm still a little skeptical. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. The other use case that is brought up a lot about AI mm. is identifying photographs of cats. And I don't think <laughs> there, there are a lot of ethical issues involved in that. But what are the other AI applications that become problematic? Um, well, first of all, there's facial recognition software that famously identifies black people as gorillas. Uh, so there's wow, a, really, still, really, wow. yeah. There's there's a whole list of ways in which biases are either built in intrinsically, uh, not because anybody's, partly because people aren't paying attention, uh, but then depending on what they train on, uh, and so somebody has to choose the material that these things are trained on, and if you end up training it mostly on white folk, then it doesn't know how to deal with dark skin. The really famous example is poor Microsoft's Tay chatbot. Uh, this was an AI that was supposed to become sociable, and within 24 hours it was spewing neo-Nazi racist stuff because that's what it learned on Twitter. Right. So <laughs> the problem is partly us. This problem it wasn't in a liberal bubble. That's, that was <laughs> no, really the... it, was, it was not. Uh, but uh, <laughs> another set of systems that I and others are, are particularly concerned about are so-called uh, preemptive policing systems uh, or systems that, for example, try to make judgments about the probability of you being uh, reincarcerated if you happen to be released from jail. So these systems are somewhere on the order of maybe 76 to 80 percent accurate, mm -hmm. and they do save time, but they're only 76 to 80 percent accurate. And if you're the criminal who has been good, um, but it make you're the 20 percent at doesn't quite like somehow. The second problem is you can't contest this. Nobody knows, because these are by definition machine learning systems that even the programmers can't predict what they will do, and in many ways they can't explain how they do it. Why are we letting critical issues in the justice system be offloaded to machines that we don't understand and that we can't contest? Hmm. So uh, if you keep humans in the loop... That might be one solution to this, but um, it's, it's a hallmark of modern law and democracy that you and I have the right, if we're accused of something, mm -hmm. you and I have a right, it's okay, fine, let's go, to, let's go to trial, let's see the evidence, let's interrogate the evidence. And so we can contest how we're being read, is the way Marie Hildebrandt puts it in, in one of her really good books on this, uh, Smart Technologies and the Ends of the Law. We can't contest the machines. Uh, the programmers can't contest them. Mm. 
Is that because we don't know how the decisions are being reached? We, yeah, we can't. It's bike boxed. And, and that's um, by design or that's the nature of how these things learn? It's both, as I understand it. So that uh, by definition, we want the devices to learn to respond to what they've learned from, you know, what they've learned through, the, through in effect, their experience, mm-hmm. and then to be able to improve on their on their performance. And so we can establish parameters for how that's done from the outset. But once the system runs, again, so far as I know, it's opaque even to the people who built the program mm-hmm. because they don't know what happened on the inside. And to take apart the millions of lines of code uh, and try to figure out what that means seems to be all but humanly impossible right. within anyone's lifetime. There are two responses that you could potentially have mm-hmm. to that understanding. One mm-hmm. is to fear technology. Um, mm-hmm. And you don't strike me as somebody who necessarily fears technology, but somebody who grapples with it. And, yeah. and how do we do that in a way that is, I guess, conscious and yeah. thoughtful? Great question. No, I, 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 <laughs> I'm a gear nut. I mean, I think this stuff is great and wonderful in all kinds of ways. Um, biographically, I, I was exposed to an analog computer when I was like fifth or sixth grade, and they're like, story over, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. this is what I'm doing. So I think these are potentially wonderful technologies. They're, they're fulfilling dreams that we've had for 2,500 years. Uh, how to calculate how the planets run, how the universe runs. Um, people like Kepler would kill for the information and the computational devices we have. Newton would too, for that matter. So, no, I think uh, I'm by no means a Luddite. But yes, I think we have to grapple with it. And I may have an overly simplified view of these things, but I think historically the way we've grappled with it has been sort of crudely, namely waiting for disasters to happen. And then saying, okay, maybe we should do something about this. What I find really, really interesting and really, really heartening is this time around, at least, with AI, social robots, no, we're figuring, we've, <laughs> we've had our damage control lessons uh, in a way. And again, these efforts on the part of the IEEE, of the EU, uh, and other, other places to say we, we need to do this right ethically from the start, this is extraordinary. This is extraordinary. This is not 10 years ago when it was a few philosophers talking to a few computer scientists. Hmm. Uh, So I I find that very heartening. And so part of what I would say in addition to that is the more people on the street, I mean, everyday folk, people who will buy these technologies, the more we learn how they work so that we can take better control and understanding of them. I think that's also key. Hard work, but... More and more people seem to be doing that in some way. And then, you know, go wild. Join a hacker space. Join a maker space. Learn, learn how these technologies really work at an even deeper level uh, so that you can tune them to what you think is a good life, to what's going to give you a sense of contentment and fulfillment mm-hmm. and meaning. It's a very idealistic vision, but that's been the vision since the Enlightenment. And um, uh, I've often heard people say in these contexts, we need a new Enlightenment. Uh, we need a new Bildung is the German word, where we educate people not just for the sake of getting a good job vocationally, but, but to enhance this sort of human-centric understanding that this is, this is not just about profit, it's not just about convenience, which all, of, all of which can be useful and good. It's about what kind of lives do we lead. And as we become more reflective about that, then I think we're in a better shape, better place to take control uh, as best we can of these things that so deeply infuse and, and define our lives and the lives of the people around us that we care about. Yeah. Some of the things that uh, AI and particularly robotics get mm. uh, talked about a lot is in the realm, we mentioned religion before, but mm. also things like sexuality, things that are really deeply human kind of right. experiences. Yeah. Um, how do those things fit together and why are these the things that we're looking to outsource? That's a really good question. <laughs> Um, why we're trying to outsource these. I think the broad answer is human beings are difficult. There's, there's a wonderful little phrase from Charlie Brown, the comic book character, I love mankind, it's people I can't stand. <laughs> um, human relationships are difficult. That's just the truth of it. I mean, if you want to 
uh, a religious start, one way of reading the book of Genesis is it's all about dysfunctional human family relationships. <laughs> am, I, am I my brother's keeper? Well, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and we're off and running. I'm, I'm not sure where to start. I mean, in Japan, this is a big problem for, for young, young people. Young people seem to be having sex less. They're dating less. They seem to be more satisfied with sort of virtual companions and virtual girlfriends. Their work lives are very strenuous. Who has time to develop a relationship? I think if you poke beneath the surface of any long-term relationship, married couple, you're going to find there were times when I don't know if we can do this anymore. I don't know that I want to do this anymore. A lot of times we work through that. Sometimes we don't. So I think the sort of starting point is it, it's hard. And this is partly why I've become interested in virtue ethics is, as you know, I don't like the term virtue so much, but what it does teach us is this doesn't come naturally. We have to work at it. Right. By virtue, you mean qualities rather than, right. than being good. Yeah, what I mean is is more like the capacities or the abilities or the habits, and these become habituated so that we, we become habitually nicer to each other if we uh -huh. practice, and that's a good thing, that are, are central to what we conceive of as a good life or a life that has meaning, sense of contentment. So that's what I mean by, by virtue. So, again, the human sphere is hard. Um, even in wonderful places like Scandinavia, where you have such a terrific life-work balance. So the temptation to offload the chores of relationship to the machines or through the machines, I think is very, very high, understandably. Uh, one of the things that, I don't know if it's happened here, but it's been observed in Norway, instead of texting, which used to be what you do because you don't want to call, because if you call, then you have to deal with the, oh my gosh, there's a moment of silence. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. um, so we text because we don't have that problem anymore. And then texting becomes a problem because it takes time. But I don't really want to call anybody, so what I'll do is leave a voice message. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've, the convenience level of communication has gone up. We still obviously care about each other and, or we wouldn't be talking. But the work level, uh, we're, 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 uh, we're learning how to be lazier and lazier about communication and relationships. And that's, that's this problem of de-skilling. Um, so that's what I worry about. Um, yeah. Although, that said, we seem to be spending an awful lot more time doing it uh, on, on like social media platforms mm. and, and like communicating with other people. Mm. It's pretty much everybody's job now. It's email, it's mm. Facebook, it's Twitter. It's, mm. you know, so um, is it just that we've, multiplied the number of communications that we've had and we've just made it more productive. It might be kind of nice to think that. I'm not entirely sure. I'm sure there's more than two sides to it. I think on the one hand, yeah, uh, it's really handy and convenient to be able to chat with my wife while she's in Palestine or wherever and my kids who are in North America. But I think many of us also feel... Uh, I mean, there is something now called digital detox, and there there has been now for two or three years this sense of this whole multitasking thing is a, is a sham. It's not multitasking. It's switch tasking, and it's not as efficient. So I think there have been recognitions that we're a little too busy with this uh, in a way. And I also know of examples of people who are finding that, for example, in the face of death, Learning about the death of a loved one because somebody has posted on their wall, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm going to miss you. This is not how you want to find out your sibling or your parent has died or your child has died. Uh, and it's not going to help you with the grieving process. 187 likes just doesn't mean very much. Um, so I know of examples, I mean, these are, these are documented through research, of young people in Norway, for example, where getting off of social media has a very high cost. And yet, because their experience with the fakery of grieving online, sometimes called Grief 2.0, on the one hand, and finding the need for embodied co-presence in mourning on the other hand, <clears throat> 
they got off of Facebook. Mm-hmm. And you can go out, you can go to other places. You can go to Snapchat and so forth. So, so it's not an either or. And I'm not trying to suggest it's an either or. I, I think what I'm seeing is we're trying to find the right balance. Uh, to go back to what you started with a few minutes ago, nobody's going to throw this away, <laughs> mm. uh, at least not for any length of time. Mm. But it, it's finding the balance, and I think finding that balance is is hard sometimes. Mm. Yeah. I notice when you're talking about other people's grief, and you collect yourself for a moment because the you you sort of you've taken that on mm-hmm. uh, in some sense, and that's. For lack of a better word, empathy. Mm-hmm. And and empathy seems to be something that is lacking in the right. world to a large extent. And there, yeah. and there are practical considerations right. that come out of that. You're clearly a very empathic, empathetic uh, person. Thank you. How do you learn that and what are the advantages of it? Mm. Well, first of all, your, your, your question is really wonderful because... Um, when you approach all of this through a kind of virtue ethics lens, empathy is perhaps the most important starting point. Uh, this you can see it negatively with with children on the autistic spectrum. Uh, the reason that at the extreme they don't relate to you because, as far as they're concerned, you're a toaster, is they they don't have the capacity for empathy. They haven't learned it. The capacity to learn it is there, but learning it is not necessarily. A given. Um, and so I think it's absolutely essential to learn empathy, but empathy can be painful, especially in those sort of very strong moments of, of grief, of loss, uh, of conflict, your marriage may be falling apart. So of course we don't want to spend our time with that if we don't have to. Uh, so again, there's a temptation. I'll communicate with my virtual girlfriend because she's predictable. I don't have to take care of her. I can turn her off if I get bored. The flip side is from Shannon Valor's the example of um, when you're four years old and you're forced to go talk to grandmother. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, but I think in some sense we have to have the courage or develop the courage to confront those moments of caregiving or of grief or of deep love. I mean, deep love can also be incredibly scary uh, and painful. And confront it, and and at the risk of sounding cliched, embracing it, uh, and taking it for both the good and the bad. And I'm fairly sure, and this is this is again kind of cliche, but as far as I know, it's true. That's how we grow as human beings. Um, there's there's a kind of an analog. If you want to be a better tennis player, don't play with somebody who's as good as you. Play with somebody who's better than you. And if you want to sort of expand your capacities to live as a feeling, reflective human being. Take some chances. Get hurt. Uh, or take the chance of getting hurt. Because I, I, I remain convinced that the flip side of that is that, yeah, how to put it, the rewards of loving will, will, be, will be provided. That seems like a fantastic place to leave <laughs> something like this, but I, I still have so many more questions. Yeah. Like, I, I guess from that, is there a politics of ethics? Is there mm. a uh, is there a team we should be picking based on our understanding of how other human beings feel and, and work? And there's, this um, mm. f- feels like a very leading question, but right. I mean, literally, is the world divided into ethical politics and I guess anti ethical politics? Yeah. It certainly is in the. <laughs> In the country I'm from, um, it's no, again, it's a really, really good question. And I think uh, one of the things that I really, really appreciate about living in Norway is that uh, there are nine functioning political parties. And I ended up having beer next to one of the leaders of one, which shows you how uh, we're not very far from power, which is another nice thing about living in Norway. So without wanting to name names, I think from virtue ethics as well as deontology, the idea that human beings are freedoms and need to be treated as such, and that means equality, and that means emancipation. I would turn the question around and say, work for the people, because sometimes the people are different from their parties. Uh, Work for the people and the parties who are clearly on the side of emancipation, clearly on the side of equality, including gender equality, sexual equality, 
And the people who are not just, you know, peace and prosperity, that's an easy slogan. Peace would be wonderful. It's very hard. But the people who are really making the difference in terms of how we're living on this planet, for the sake of our grandchildren. I don't know why I'm so weepy today. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, it's, 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 oh. it, it drives it home really well because right. I don't have grandchildren, mm. but I imagine if I did, yeah. the idea of the future of, of, uh, of the earth and the, the future of how people you know, set up institutions now in order to take care of what happens mm. in the future – would have a similar impact yeah. on me. I mean, yeah. My son is an adult, yeah. um, and so he's operating in my world as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But there is a world to come, and you seem very invested in that. Yeah. It's partly because Norway is a country that is very attuned to the environment and to these issues. Uh, last fall, when the uh, UN panel came out on climate change, there were, there were young people going around saying... We're the first generation and the last generation. So we're the first generation to feel the effects of climate change. And we're the last generation to have any hope of doing anything about it. I grew up in the 60s. We had, we had the threat of nuclear holocaust. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes, we could all be gone yep. and never know. That's a hell of a way to grow up. Mm. Um, there was a great song by Bob Dylan about the masters of war who have hurled into the world the worst fear you can hurl, the fear of bringing a child into this world. And I hear young people struggling with that today. It's mm. a terrible thing to throw on a young person. I, yeah. Is it fair to say that every generation has that? I mean, I grew up in the in the late 70s, early 80s, and so we had this uh, nuclear holocaust was the, right. the, the big factor then, the minutes to midnight, um, right. you know, Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the sort of existential peril, haven't we all always had that, or is this new? Well, I mean, from an existentialist perspective, death is always possible. And yes, you had plagues in the Middle Ages and so forth, but those were extraordinary. They weren't daily confrontations. Mm. Um, I think what's different now, since the 20th century, I mean, this is sort of classic existentialism, since the First World War, we have had machineries of industrializing death. And by industrializing, we mean mass scale. So... Millions and millions of people slaughtered in the First World War, over 50 million in the Second World War. Uh, nuclear Holocaust, hundreds of million, billions of people. The planet itself. Mm. That, I think, is qualitatively new. And I think it cuts us in at least two different directions. One of them is it is so horrifying to contemplate for any length of time that we spend a lot of time <laughs> doing everything we can not to. So this Neil Postman idea of amusing ourselves to death. Mm -hmm. It makes sense in a way, but it doesn't help the problem. Uh, so I think, you know, we're very good. You, there's a way in which you can't constantly think about your own mortality. Uh, even can't, you know, I've, I've had cancer diagnoses twice, uh, or almost cancer diagnoses twice. So this is this is the sort of classic moment for us in the industrial world. You might have cancer. You might die in three years. Okay, uh, that puts your world in perspective, and so every second becomes precious. Mm. But you can't live like that, or I can't. Mm. I don't know anybody who can for about more than three weeks, mm. approximately. It's just too intense. Uh, the There's only so many days you can seize. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's it's uh, Leonard Cohen put it nicely in an interview one time. You know, your body sends you signals. It's not going to go on like this forever. But it's really nice to sit down in the morning and pretend it will. Uh, so I can piddle with that and do that. Let's go do something fun. You know, perhaps not terribly meaningful, but it's fun. That's also good. So it's it's understandable that we turn away as best we can from these kinds of things. But I, I think both individually, the lesson of existentialism, and to some degree, the lesson of some religions. I, I go back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, as well as a different reading of the Garden of Eden story. 
if you want to grow up as a human being, you have to recognize you're going to die. Because it's only then that you start to take responsibility for either finding meaning or creating meaning in your life. And it's meaning that you craft, you create. It can be in coherency with other people. It can include traditions. It can be novel. It can be creative. But you have to do it. And if you don't, it's not necessarily a tragedy, but you've missed in some ways really the most distinctive opportunity of being a human being, and that is free choice in terms of crafting crafting your life. I, I did want to touch on this idea, and I'll, uh, so there are a couple of threads that I want to pick up on that. The mm. first one is this idea of creativity as an essential mm. part of the sort of human experience yeah. and the relationship of creativity to these things that we're talking about, about ethics right. and, and so on. So l- let's start with that, and I'll get back to the yeah. industrialised death a little bit later. <laughs> My question, I guess, is, is how do you fit this idea of creativity and you know artistic expression and, right. and those things into this framework of uh, being in the world, being ethical, right. living deliberately? Uh, right. You know, how important is it that we do those things, or is it just you know, well, it's entertaining in the meantime? And oh no, 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 no. I mean, it can be entertaining. It can be just decoration. But um, on the other hand, decoration is also nice. But there's a wonderful phrase. I don't know who said it, but it was something like. Poetry is arrayed upon the inarticulate. And I like that because I think philosophy is arrayed on the inarticulate, things we somehow know but can't quite get out without some work. And so what I find in poetry and in the arts and in music and in language, for that matter, learning a new language, that is so valuable is that it cracks open. Um, it cracks open the ordinary. Leonard Cohen's song... Um, anthem is some people know it and he talks about there's a crack there's a crack in everything that's how the light gets in Mm -hmm. he's referring to a Jewish mystic from the 15th century it's a long story I don't need to repeat it but basically it's through these cracks that something new breaks in and helps sort of open up the everyday and you, you see things in new ways you may see them in extraordinary new ways and those can open up new possibilities for us. So this is sort of standard existentialism, but it, I think it's standard human beings. In a certain way, for us to separate the arts from the humanities, from the sciences, I mean, this is, this is very sort of 18th century. And if we go back to the Renaissance, the so-called Renaissance man or woman doing everything, well, of course, because all of this is necessary. Mm. In existential traditions, you have people like Nietzsche. He never really wrote an academic paper. These were essays, and they were specific kinds of essays that were intended to crack open the academic linear argument. And they were intended to be aesthetic. They were intended to be artistic. So Sartre wrote, Nietzsche also wrote music for that matter, but Sartre wrote plays. You want to convey your message? Do it in a play. Tell us other people. Well, it's a little depressing, but okay, there's <laughs> here's the play. So I don't think there's an inessential connection at all between the arts and thinking about things ethically. Uh, the flip side of that is this is why, in it's not just virtue ethics, but this is why in religious tradition and in the arts, we're interested in heroes. We're interested in anti-heroes. Most of us don't study academic ethics but we we might go to a play we might go to a film and it's those people who strike us in an interesting way that can help us inspire us to think about our lives in new ways and so i think there there's an enormous range of essential resources and even thinking about it as resources is sort of industrial Mm. but um no what i find for example here in hoom lab we have an artist in residence so humanities and computing and an artist in residence, that's extremely cool. Mm. And mo- many of the projects that I'm seeing coming out now um, that are trying to feel our way, think our way, reflect our way into a more humane future, they include art. So I think we're, we're learning to do that in, in good ways. Mm. Yeah. The art <laughs> thing is interesting because it seems like small personal acts of good, if you like, mm. and... To go back to the uh, industrialization mm. of death, that mm. seems monolithic and mm. this huge. So, so essentially, evil is uh, the way I talk about it. Evil is elephants, and <laughs> and good is insects, uh, and the insects outweigh the elephants right. in the world. Yeah. But the elephants, you put an elephant in the room, and it's the most overbearing thing. It's the one thing that you see. Right. 
and and that's how I think I retain optimism is that right. that you know the good is insects right. and insects outweigh the elephants. But do, do you share that optimism? I mean, you put yeah. the industrialized death and you put AI into the mix. The first mm. thing you go to is Terminator, right? right? Yeah. Is is that our future, or are, are all the little good acts of creativity enough to counterbalance? I I. I'm inclined to be optimistic, and it's not just because I'm a, na a naive American whose DNA is programmed to make me optimistic. I think I, there are two aspects of this. Elie Wiesel, the Holocaust survivor, said, um, the good news is over six billion people got up this morning without thinking about how they were going to kill their neighbor. So... I think if we step back and we, we just sort of look at how we treat each other, uh, even if it's automatic, even if it's for self-interested reasons, uh, there are these small acts of kindness that we do quite frequently with one another that I think may make a huge amount of difference. Uh, we tend to take it for granted, perhaps. And yes, I agree. I, I want very much want to sort of underscore, agree with you. I think those those six billion people who woke up this morning without trying to think about how they're going to kill their neighbor, they're the vast majority of human beings. And in the long run, if we have a long run, they'll win. They have so far, and I think there are reasons to think that they will continue to do so. What that means, though, is two things. One is the more we offload human decision-making into autonomous machines that we do not understand, the less capacity we have to exercise our agency, including our agency for good. Our agency for evil, but our agency for good. Uh, so from my perspective, this is a particularly important time for as many of us as possible to realize what we do now, what we choose now, who we elect, how we consume, how we live. These are choices that have the potential of making an enormous difference for, for ourselves now as well as for our children and our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. The more we recognize we have agency and take that agency, then uh, the more I think we have the better chance of you know, outliving the elephants. <laughs> So can you reassure us as a professor of ethics that the arc of history curves towards justice? Yes, <laughs> but not without pain and not without sacrifice, uh, sometimes enormous sacrifice. You're thinking of a specific example? We're, <clears throat> sorry, we're close to the um, observances for Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, but I'm also thinking of, of, I mean, you name it, victims of whatever war is going on right now. There's, there's no shortage. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no shortage of injustice or terror in the world. Yeah. But the answer, I guess, is to work on making sure that we design systems that pull in the other direction? Pull the other direction, and don't forget that we're in the system, that we create the system and that we can guide the system, and that we can do things apart from the system that will make enormous differences. I mean, it, it's perhaps trite and cliched, but I still think it's true. It doesn't take a lot of people to make an enormous difference. Mm. Uh, it's one of the really interesting things about human history. It's sometimes the striking individuals who seem to come out of nowhere. I mean, three years ago, if you'd said this, this young girl from Sweden uh, sitting outside of parliament by herself on a school day, she's going to change the world? You're out of your mind. Of course not. Completely irrational. And yet, something extraordinary has happened. At the same time, we want, so I want to lift up these moral heroes who, who have the courage to do something that sometimes will take off in an extraordinary way, but not at the cost of recognizing that all of us have these kinds of capacities, if at a lesser scale or a lesser dramatic impact. 
And the more we choose, the more we recognize that we can turn things, uh, then I think the chances are clearly much greater that, uh, yes, the arc of history will, will turn in the directions that we, or at least I think, are best in terms of emancipation, equality, greater sustainability on the planet, those kinds of things. This has been absolutely fascinating, and I, I kind of feel like I could uh, keep this line of conversation going on for, for a lot longer. I just, I, I guess what I want is a pragmatic takeaway for oh, people listening sure. to this. Yeah. How should we then live? Live a good life. Uh, be as reflective as you can about what you're doing. Be as careful in, in the literal sense, but also the figurative sense. Try to exercise more care, as much care as possible both to the people around you you know and those who you don't know. Um, take a chance on empathy. Speak up. Ask people what you can do. If we can use religious language, one of my colleagues said something, I think, very striking just a few days ago. Uh, she said, the method is to treat others better than yourself. That's where God is. And what I think is true from both sort of scholarly and more experiential approaches is, I mean, you can find this in the literature on psychology of happiness and that kind of thing. Connecting up with giving something of yourself to another or to something that is in some ways greater than you and works on the side of greater compassion, greater empathy, and so forth, Almost everybody finds that their lives are much more meaningful in doing that. I, I can't think of a religious tradition or ethical framework that in some way or another doesn't support that view. If you interrogate the, the literatures of so-called mysticism, Buddhism, etc., it circles down really to a very simple truth. I think it's true. It's a very simple idea. Give a little bit more of yourself to something else around you besides yourself. And, yeah, that'll make a difference. Charles, thanks so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you. I hope some of this is useful. <laughs> I is that how we measure it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's professor, philosopher, and good ethical human being, Charles S. And that's the MTF Podcast. If you enjoyed that and you're interested in some related material about AI, ethics, and internet culture, do check out some past episodes of the podcast. Let's start with fellow internet research pioneer Nancy Bames' episode, AI expert Christian Gutman, internet activist and author Corey Doctorow, philosopher, composer, turntablist, and polymath Paul Miller, a.k.a. DJ Spooky, and the special episode we did at MTF Urubro at Urubro University about a month back with AI professor Amy Lutfi, music tech CEO Nicholas Morlander, and Michaela Magus, who you know as MTF's founder and advisor to the European Commission on things like AI, innovation, and the creative industries. I can thoroughly recommend these conversations as they're all with outstanding people with brilliant insight, each shedding more light on this same territory. Don't forget to spread the word, press the star button, like, share, rate, review, and most importantly, subscribe. And we'll talk soon. Have a great week. Cheers. Cheers.